On the morning of the 19th of February 1942, fighters, bombers, and aircraft carriers from the Japanese Navy were launched for the air raids on Darwin, the largest single attack ever mounted by a foreign power on Australia. Also known as the Australian Pearl Harbor, this is the bombing of Darwin. Darwin, is the capital city of the Northern Territory of Australia, situated on the Timor Sea. It was a small town with limited civil and military infrastructure, with a population of 5,800 people. Due to its strategic position in Northern Australia, the Royal Australian Navy RAN, and Royal Australian Air Force RAAF, had constructed bases near the town in the 1930s, and the early years of World War II. As early as August 1941, Darwin had been a key in the South Pacific Air Ferry Route, designed to avoid routes through the Japanese Mandate in the Central Pacific. For bomber reinforcement of the Philippines. By November 1941, the Allies envisioned Darwin as the hub of transshipment efforts to support the Java and Philippine forces, and due to its importance, the Australian government considered it as a vital asset in Australia's defence, against an expanding imperial of Japan. Australia, lay directly south of the newly consolidated Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, where Japanese military leaders feared that it would be used as a base by the Allies. To strike at Japan's newly won empire, Commander of the Combined Fleet, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, feared Darwin was a possible hindrance to Japanese operations in Java and Timor. He submitted proposals for an amphibious invasion of the Darwin area, but the Navy and Army General Staff rejected that option. Indicating that the continent required more troops to subdue and garrison than Japan had to expend. So Australia's northern ports had to be neutralized instead, and the islands above it had to be seized as a buffer to prevent allied counterstrokes against Japan's newly vital islands and resource centers. Destroying Darwin was the first step in that process, and offered the additional advantage of diverting allied resources to Australia's defense, and away from the fighting in Southeast Asia. Following the outbreak of the Pacific War in early December 1941, Darwin's defences were strengthened. In line with plans developed before the war, several Australian Army and Royal Australian Air Force units stationed in the town were sent to the Netherlands East Indies to strengthen the defences of the islands of Ambon and Timor. The harbour underwent improvements to coastal defences and port facilities, while local airfield facilities were also upgraded, and the garrison was steadily increased. Following the outbreak of the war, all but 2,000 civilians were evacuated from the town to the southern Australia state. Despite Darwin's strategic importance to the defence of Australia, the city was poorly defended. The Australian Army's 14th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery, comprised 16 QF 3.7-inch AA guns, and two 3-inch AA guns, to counter aircraft flying at high altitudes, and eight Lewis guns, for use against low-flying raiders. The crews of these guns had conducted little recent training, due to ammunition shortages. Also stationed at Darwin was the headquarters of Brigadier David Blake's 7th Military District, with about two militia battalions of the citizens' military forces. The air forces stationed in the town was RAAF No. 12 Squadron, which was equipped with five unserviceable CAC Wiraway, advanced trainers used as fighters, and RAAF No. 13 Squadron with three Lockheed Hudson Light Bombers. Also present on the day of the attack were 10 P-40 Warhawk fighters, from the U.S. 33rd Pursuit Squadron of the U.S. Army Air Force, which had arrived Darwin on 15 February. They were due to take off for Timor, on their way to Java. 
There was an air warning radar unit in the city, but the equipment was incomplete, and the last of radar equipment would not arrive at Darwin until 22 February. To support the invasion of Timor, and to interdict the flow of material and supplies to Java from Darwin, a surprise air raid was planned against Port Darwin. An internal draft plan of operation was drawn by Southern Task Force Commander, Vice Admiral Nobuta K. Kondo. For the attack on Darwin, Kondo had assembled a large strike force, the IJN First Air Fleet, under the command of Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo. This force comprised the aircraft carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Hiyu, and Soyu, escorted by two heavy cruisers of 8th Cruiser Division, and 1st Destroyer Squadron, comprised of a light cruiser and seven destroyers. Each carrier had an established strength of 63 to 72 aircraft, comprising 27 Nakajima B 5 and 2 Kate torpedo bombers, 18 Aichi D 3A 1 Valdive bombers, and 18 Mitsubishi A 6 M 2 fighters. A total of 432 aircraft with reserves, led by Air Group Commander Mitsuo Fushida. The carrier-borne aircraft were manned by experienced pilots and crews, around 80% of whom had participated in the Pearl Harbor attacks. Three submarines of the 6th Submarine Squadron also grouped with the force. These task force would leave Palau and proceed to Timor Sea, 350 kilometers northwest of Darwin. Their objective was to conduct a surprise attack and to destroy the port facilities, sink as many ships in the harbor as possible, and destroy infrastructures like oil storage and the army base. In addition to the carrier bon aircraft, 54 land-based naval bombers also would carry out the raid on Darwin on the same day. These units comprised of 27 Mitsubishi G-4 Mbeti medium bombers from the Kano Yair Air Group based at Kendari, and 27 Mitsubishi G-3M Nel medium bombers from the 1st Air Group operating at Ambon. Both air groups were comprised of the IJN 21st Air Flotilla, under the command of the 11th Air Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Nishizo Sukuhara. Their objective was to conduct the noon raid and to destroy the RAAF base. On the 9th of February 1942, the suggestion of a strike on Darwin, by Rear Admiral Damon Yamaguchi, was followed up by the Southern Area Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo. Kondo then relayed it to the Commander of Combine Fleet, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. At 10.20 on the 10th of February, a Mitsubishi C-5 M2 Babs reconnaissance aircraft, from the 3rd Air Group took off from Ambon, to carry out a covert photo reconnaissance over Port Darwin. After stealthily reconnoitering over, and taking photos of Port Darwin, the C-5 M2 Babs landed on Ambon at 17.20. The crew reported that they identified an aircraft carrier, five destroyers, and 21 merchant ships in Darwin Harbor, as well as 30 aircraft at the town's two airfields. Though at the time, there is no aircraft carrier at Darwin. The crew had sighted a former aircraft carrier, converted to seaplane tender, USS Langley, who left on the 11th of February. On 15 February, one U.S. Army transport ship, and three civilian transport ship, carrying troops for Timor reinforcement, consisted of U.S. Army of the 147th and 148th Field Artillery. And Australian troops of the 24th Pioneer Battalion departed Darwin at 2 o'clock. The convoy was escorted by a heavy cruiser, USS Houston, one destroyer, USS Peary, and two Royal Australian Navy sloops. On the same day, at 1400 hours, the IJN First Carrier Air Fleet Task Force left Palau for Timor Sea for the attacks on Port Darwin. One of the carriers, the IJN Kargar, was limited to 18 knots because she had struck an uncharted reef. 
while shifting mooring positions. On the afternoon of the 18th of February, the Allied convoy, that was bound for Timor had returned to Darwin. The convoy had to reverse course on the 16th of February, after the Supreme Commander of Abda Command, General Wavell, had received intelligence information, that indicated the invasion of Timor was imminent. He also feared that a Japanese carrier was in the area to cover the landing. The constant air attack on the Timor convoy was one major piece of that evidence. The Houston, and the Perry, then were ordered to leave Darwin, and joined the Rear Admiral Dorman Strike Force at Chila Chap. After a Japanese invasion convoy for Bali had been sighted on Makassar Strait. The Houston, and the Perry, departed on that day. Shortly after departure, the Peary sonar detected a suspected submarine, and launched a search that lasts several hours, while Houston continued alone. However, they found nothing, and returned to Darwin for a refuel. This took longer than expected, and USS Berry Commander, Lieutenant Commander Keith, decided to remain at Darwin overnight, and sail for Chila Chap on the next morning. By dawn of the 19th of February, after cautiously sailed to the south, Vice Admiral Nagimo Carrier's task force had arrived at a pre-arranged launch point, 350 kilometers northwest of Darwin. A weather reconnaissance aircraft had been launched from the cruiser, Tone, at dawn and arrived over Darwin at around 8.30. With the weather fine and clear, the attack on Darwin was confirmed and Nagimo ordered the strike. At 8.30, the carriers launched the first wave, consists of 81 B-5 and 2 Kate torpedo bombers, but functioning as level bombers. Escorted by 18 A-6 M-20 fighters. At 9 o'clock, the second wave is launched with 71 D-3A-1 Valdite bombers. Escorted by 18 A-6 M-20 fighters. The second wave would catch up with the first wave before arriving over Darwin. A total of 188 aircraft was launched. The attack was led by Commander, Mitsuo Fujita, aboard an Akajima B-5 N2 Kate. The order also was given to land-based bombers and flying boats of IJN 21st Air Flotilla. The land-based bombers would attack the Darwin airfield at 11.30, while flying boats will seek the enemy in the Arafura Sea and the Timor Sea. 27 Mitsubishi G4M Betty medium bombers of Kanoya, Air Group, led by Lieutenant Commander Toshi Iirisa, departed Kendari at 0905. While 27 Mitsubishi G3M Nel medium bombers of 1st Air Group, led by Lieutenant Commander Takio Ozaki, departed Ambon 5 minutes later. They were to joining over Banda Sea before headed for Darwin. As morning on the 19th of February came around, it seemed like another normal day in Darwin. The freighter, MV Neptuna, carrying material for the extension of the harbour boom, and 200 tonnes of depth charges, was at the wharf's outer berth. The Australian freighter, SS Barossa, with wood to extend the wharf, was also present. There were three American transport ships, USAT Meeks, Mauna Loa, and SS Port Mar, of the returned Timor convoy. There was the British ship, MV Tulagi, also from the returned Timor convoy. The British tanker, MV British Motorist, was there to replenish Darwin's stocks of fuel. The hospital ship, HMAHS Manunda, originally bound for Singapore, was in the anchorage, as was the Australian freighter, SS Zealandia, carrying ammunition. 
destroyer, USS Peary, was trying to get topped off with fuel to head to Java. A destroyer seaplane tender, the USS William B. Preston, was servicing its Catalinas. There were some 47 vessels in all. Six remaining Hudsons from RAAF-2 Squadron, who had evacuated Dutch Timor, also arrived early in the morning. Also, five PBY Catalinas of Patrol Wing 10 had gone out on a routine patrol over the Timor Sea. One of those patrols the area around Bathurst Island. In addition to the vessels in port, the U.S. supply ships, USAT Don Isidro, and SS Florence D, were near Bathurst Island. They were bound for Philippines, bringing ammunition to General Douglas MacArthur's besieged forces there. For Don Isidro, after being discovered by the Japanese float plane a day before, her captain decided to reverse course, and head back for Darwin. At 9.15, 10 P-40 Warhawks of the U.S. Army Air Force 33rd Pursuit Squadron, under command of Major Floyd Pell, took off and heading west for Timor on the first leg of their journey to Java. However, they were recalled back 20 minutes later because of bad weather. By 9.15, as the first air attack fleet en route to Darwin, the formation encountered a patrol wing 10 PBY Catalina, flown by Lieutenant Thomas Mora, who was on patrol out of Darwin. Nine Kagas Zeros was broke from formation, to intercept an American patrol. One of the Zeros, flown by naval air pilot, First Class Yoshikazu Nagahama, bounced the Catalina, before Mora's crew knew what hit them. With both engines dead, Mora PBY Catalina forced to make a hard landing on the sea. Eight Kaga Zeros then return to the main formation, while one Zero loses from formation and proceeds to Darwin alone. Observing the action was a small Filipino merchant ship, the SS Florence D, altered course and rescued the crew a short time later. At 9.37, Father McGrath of the Sacred Heart Mission, on Bathurst Island, who was also an Australian coast watcher, observed a large force of aircraft heading south, and sent a message using a pedal radio to the coastal radio station at Darwin. However, no general alarm was given at Darwin. The RAAF officers judged that the aircraft, which had been sighted was 10 P-40 Warhawks, who had recalled back after bad weather. A grave error was made, considered that P-40 is not coming from the north rather than from the west. As the attack fleet flew across the Tiwi Islands, 6-0 from Hiyu, split from the main formation, and strafed the Bathurst Island mission and a stranded C-53 on the airstrip. The aircraft was destroyed, and several buildings, including the radio shack, were damaged. At 9.40, 10 P-40 Warhawks was back at Darwin. Five Warhawks landed to refuel, while the remainder, patrolled over Darwin's sky. At the same time, the main Japanese force crosses the coast east of Darwin, and then turns over the 35 km peg, on its approach to the town from the southeast, in an effort for some deception. Despite the main force having been reported, but not yet over Darwin, the first Japanese aircraft to arrive was a lonely Zero, flown by Nagahama, who had broken off early from the main formation. Between 9.37 and 9.45, he quickly engaged five P-40 Warhawks of the 33rd Pursuit Squadron, who still in the air, as they attempted to protect the other five who were already landing. Nagahama Zero was too quick. Four Warhawks were quickly shot down, while one managed to break off over the flights, and heads to the southeast. At 9.55, the main formation approached the target from the southeast, and discovered that still no alarm had been sounded in Darwin. Like the attack on Pearl Harbor, the IJN task force once again had achieved a complete surprise on Darwin. 
The attack commenced when nine low-flying Zero fighters from Kargar, who had split from the main formation, strafed an auxiliary minesweeper, HMAS Gunbar, as a prelude to commencing the major attack. At 9.58, the air raid sirens of Darwin were sounded. 16 3.7-inch heavy anti-aircraft guns opened fire. The five war hawks, which had landed were shocked to discover that they were under attack by Japanese Zeros. They tried to take off again. Two were able to get to the sky, including squadron leader, Major Pell, but immediately shot down by Japanese Zeros from Hiryu, and was killed when he parachuted out of the aircraft. The other war hawks on the ground were destroyed, as they tried to take off. Darwin's air defense now had been eliminated. What left his 16 3.7-inch heavy air guns on the ground to do the job? Meanwhile, Mitsuo Fushida bombers began their run, over the harbor and town. At 9.59, all B-5 and 2, Kate level bombers began attacking ship at the harbor, while the fighter group strafed AA position, and other targets of opportunity. 800 kg bombs struck the wharf, blowing the Pierce train into the harbor. Explosions destroyed water mains, oil pipes, and much of the pier. Strings of bombs moved across the hospital, post office, police barracks, and through the town's government offices. They were smashed and left in smoldering ruins. The Japanese had learned a lesson from the past. They were not making the same mistake again, as they made at Pearl Harbor, by attacking only the ships. As the Kate high-level bombers complete their bombing run, at 10.03, the Valdive bombers began their attack. 71 D3A1 Valdive bombers were divided into two groups. All Valdive bombers from Akagi, Hiryu, Soyu, and part of Kargar dive bombers, to attack the port and military installation, while the other part of Kargar dive bombers, attacks the Parap civil airfield, and the RAAF station. At 10.10, the situation deteriorated rapidly. At the dock, shipping riding a tanker was then being subjected to devastating pattern bombing, dive bombing, and machine gun sweeps. Both the Rossa and Neptuna, at the dock, took early bomb hits and were set afire. The three PBY of patrol wing 10 on the water, were destroyed by gunfire from Kargar Zeros. Swan, Warrigo, Peary, and William B. Preston, managed to get underway. However, it was the destroyer Peary that was the largest warship in the harbor, and she took more than her share of Japanese air attack. After evading the first few bombs, Peary took five bomb hits in rapid succession. The ship broke apart. She sank later at 1300 hours, along with her commanding officer. The Manunda, a hospital ship, then sent out rescue boats to rescue Perry's surviving crew. Shortly afterward, she was hit by a Valdive bomber. Despite 12 killed and 47 wounded among the crew and medical staff, Manunda continued to function as a hospital ship. U.S. Army Transport, USA T. Meigs, was ablaze and sinking. Mauna Loa had a broken back and was going down by the stern, although her entire crew was rescued. A British tanker, MV British motorist was sinking by the boat. Port Mar was beached. At about the same time, Zealandia took a bomb down her hatch that exploded deep in the hold. The port and harbor were wracked by an almost volcanic explosion, as the 200 tons of depth charges on the blazing Neptuna detonated and sent shockwaves through the harbor. The nearby Barossa, being towed clear when Neptune exploded, had to be beached, and her timber cargo completely lost. At the same time, Swan was badly damaged by a near miss. At 10.30, about 30 minutes after it had started, the strike force commander, Commander Mitsuo Fushida, signals the last of the his aircraft, to return to the carrier task force.
At 10.45, as they headed back, however, they spotted two Philippine cargo schooners, the USAT Don Isidro, and the SS Florence D, and reported it to 1st Carrier Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo. Before they headed back, nine zeros from the carrier saw you, attack the freighter, Don Isidro, to slow its speed. Darwin's agony was not over yet. The second wave, making up of 54 land-based medium bombers from Kanoya, Air Group, and 1st Air Group, arrived over Darwin just before midday. At 11.58, the town air raid siren was sounded. As the bomber force approached Darwin at 18,000 feet, they ignore the town and harbor, instead, they concentrate on the military airfield. What little the first wave had left untouched, the bombers finished off. One of these formations attacked RAAF base Darwin from the southwest, while the other approached from the northeast. The two formations arrived over the base at the same time, and dropped their bombs simultaneously. This massive load of explosives from 54 aircraft, struck the entire area of the airfield simultaneously, and with terrifying force. The highly disciplined waves of bombers then wheeled, and turned, rearranged themselves in tidy formations, and swept back over the RAAF base. For another simultaneous release of up to 13,000 kilograms of high explosive, at 18,000 feet, the bombers were well beyond the range of the machine guns. The Australian heavy anti-aircraft flak gunners were unable to shoot down, or damage any of the high-flying Japanese aircraft, due to defective fuses. The second wave raid inflicted extensive damage on the RAAF base. The highly accurate pattern bombing destroyed two hangars, runways, four dormitories, the hospital, mess halls, equipment stores, and several other buildings. Six Hudson light bombers were also destroyed, and another Hudson, and a Wirawi were badly damaged. The second raid lasts only 20 minutes, and at about 12.20, all 54 Japanese medium bombers left Darwin. After receiving reported that two cargo ships were spotted, Vice Admiral Nagimo immediately ordered the cruisers, Tone and Shikuma, to probe the spotted vessel, while ordering Soyu and Hiyu to attack it after they received the first wave aircraft. Tone launched an Aichi E13A1 Jake reconnaissance float plane to scout the reported ships. A Jake reconnaissance float plane later located Don Isidro, at about 1500 hours. Two bombs were dropped, but neither hits the ship. At much the same time, nine D3A1 Val dive bombers on each of the carriers, Soyu, and Hiyu, were launched. The planes from Soyu found the ship, one and a half hours later. The nine dive bombers scored five direct hits, leaving the ship heavily damaged and afire. She was beached on the north coast later, to avoid sinking. Just 50 kilometers to the south, Florence D picked up a distress call from Don Isidro, and immediately changed course to assist. However, they were spotted by an E-13A1 Jake reconnaissance float plane. Unarmed and with a top speed of only 10 knots, the captain decided that it was useless to outmaneuver the float plane. The reconnaissance float plane dropped two bombs, but neither hit the ship, before flying off to the west. 
Under the threat from Japanese bombers, Florence D. Captain decided that it was too dangerous to proceed to the Philippine, and turned back for Darwin. Unfortunately, approximately two hours later, here U-9D3A1 Valdive bombers, found the freighter, and launched an immediate attack. Two bombs were hit, on a cargo ship full of ammunitions, ensuring the end of Florence D. Florence D went down by the bow within minutes. At the end of this horrific day in Darwin, nine ships had been sunk, nine P-40s from USAAF 33rd Pursuit Squadron destroyed in the air, while two more P-40s, all six RAAF No. 2 Squadron Hudsons, and one LB-30 destroyed on the ground. Three US Navy Patrol Wing 10 also burned in the harbor. Another 278 RAAF personnel were considered to have deserted as a result of the raids, although it has been argued that the desertions were mostly the result of ambiguous orders, given to RAAF ground staff after the attacks. Some 250 people had been killed, mostly on the Piri, and Neptuna. The government in Canberra suppressed these casualty figures, out of fear for panic among the Australian population. Darwin was destroyed as a serviceable base. Coming on the heels of the Singapore disaster, the raid was interpreted as a prelude to an invasion on the continent. Australia is now living in the darkest hour. Any request by the Allies, to send Australian Corps to outer territories had been blocked. After the, the 19th of February raid, the Japanese made 64 more bombing attacks on the Northern Territory, and parts of Western Australia's north coast, between the 4th of March 1942 and the 12th of November 1943. But none of the attacks are devastating as the Darwin Raid. For the Japanese, the first air fleet strike on Darwin succeeded in eliminating all of these threats to the Timor invasion. The Timor convoys were undetected until they reached their destinations, and unloading was unimpeded. They had achieved complete surprise on Darwin, as they did on Pearl Harbor. Despite the heavy fire from Australian AA guns, the Japanese lost only one zero, and two valves, over Darwin. One Kate was also forced to ditch in the ocean on the return flight, but its crew was rescued. Another 34 planes were damaged in varying degrees. So in this respect, the Darwin raid was a successful operation. However, Nagumos described the operation as, using a sledgehammer to break an egg, while Fuchida would later say that, the job to be done seemed hardly worthy of the Nagumo force. After the attack, the Nagumo carrier fleet headed to Kendari for refueled and resupply. They were joined by Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo, with the 4th Cruiser Squadron, and 2 3rd Battleship Squadron. They are getting ready for the Indian Ocean, for the end game of Java. Thank you for watching. Please stay tuned on Vector History for the future videos. Press like, leave comments, and share if you like the videos. And more importantly, don't forget to subscribe.